Good afternoon. Thank you once again for tuning in. I came across a video by Colm Gibney is his name. He made a great video on star forts. It's only 15 minutes to watch and in short he takes a historical map, a few maps actually, and compares them to present day ones on Google Earth, Google Maps. And he had a unique way of doing this and I won't say too much more just please go check out Colm Gibney's video link in the description below okay so today I would like to talk about Uzbekistan and if you're like me I didn't know much about Uzbekistan so rather than provide a bunch of links in the description I will try and cover Uzbekistan myself I have a few reasons for looking at Uzbekistan, but I'll get into that. Here's a little something I came up with on Windows Movie Maker. Uzbekistan, officially also the Republic of Uzbekistan, is a doubly landlocked sovereign state in Central Asia. It is a secular, unitary, constitutional republic comprising 12 provinces, one autonomous republic, and a capital city. Uzbekistan is bordered by five landlocked countries, Kazakhstan to the north, Kyrgyzstan to the northeast, Tajikistan to the southeast, Afghanistan to the south, and Turkmenistan to the southwest. Official history, and I took this off Wikipedia and shortened it just a little bit. What is now Uzbekistan was in ancient times part of the Iranian-speaking region of Transoxiana. The first recorded settlers were Eastern Iranian nomads known as Scythians who founded kingdoms in Khwarezm, Bactria, Sogdia, Fergana, and Margiana. Forgive me because I probably said at least a few of those wrong. It was part of the Persian Empire until the Muslim conquest in the 7th century. The local Khwarezm or Khwarezmian dynasty and the Central and Central Asia as a whole were decimated by the Mongol invasion in the 13th century. After the Mongol conquests, the area became increasingly dominated by Turkic peoples. The Turco-Mongol warlord Timur, also known as one of Genghis Khan's grandchildren, is tied to the history of the country. Uzbekistan was gradually incorporated into the Russian Empire during the 19th century, with Tashkent becoming the political center of Russian Turkestan. In 1924, the Constituent Republic of the Soviet Union, known as the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, was created. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, it declared independence as the Republic of Uzbekistan in August of 1991. Now, I'm not an expert on Uzbek history, but as you know, on my channel, I've had reason to question the historical timeline of events. My main reason for being suspicious of official history is because of evidence of mud flood. Mud flood, an obscure event or events which happened in the past, leaving a uniformly distributed layer of soil or dirt over all habitable land. When and how it happened remains a mystery, but it is generally supposed to have happened around the 1840s and 1850s. Official history has neglected mention of a mud flood event, and yet widespread evidence of mud flood is apparent in virtually every major city on Earth. Cataclysmic destruction of innumerable cities on Earth can be found if one spends the effort to look at early photography. The Chicago Fire of 1871 is but one example. So when I read Uzbekistan's history, 
that it was once peopled by eastern Iranian nomads known as Scythians, and then later it was decimated by Turco-Mongol warlords, I get a little bit suspicious. What grabs my attention is that one civilization was replaced by another. But I'm not the only one saying these things. Sergei Ignatenko is a Russian language YouTuber that speaks on this subject. I don't want to misquote him, so I'll leave a link for him in the description below. You'll have to open up his video and open up the transcript and then use your internet browser to translate it into English. It does take a little bit of work. Now, the last thing I am questioning is the people that live in present-day Uzbekistan. That's not my point, but I am suspicious of official history. As I just mentioned, mud flood evidence has got me questioning everything I thought I knew, but also there has been a lot of recent discussion about a lost empire. Some say Atlantis. Others are looking to old maps where in bold letters Tartaria appears across the landmass between Moscow to the Pacific Ocean. Today we know this as the territory of Russia. How much can you say you know about this land? Google tells me that Russia covers one-eighth of the world's land surface. Personally, I have to plead ignorance when it comes to what goes on in places like, well, Uzbekistan. But why have I chosen to discuss Uzbekistan today? My short answer is that Uzbekistan's geography is within the realm of what can be seen on old maps about Tartaria. Allow me to demonstrate. Let's do a search on Wikipedia for Tartaria. I am brought to the page called Tartary. It begins by saying Tartary, Latin, Tartaria, or Great Tartaria. Latin Tartaria Magna was a name used for the Middle Ages until the 20th century to designate the great tract of Northern and Central Asia stretching from the Caspian Sea and the Ural Mountains to the Pacific Ocean, inhabited mostly by Turco-Mongol peoples after the Mongol invasion and the subsequent Turkic migrations. In my opinion, there is much in this definition of Tartaria which has been challenged of recent. But briefly, I think what a lot of people like Sergei Ignatenko or Philip Druzhinin are speculating on is that perhaps Tartaria was not merely a geographical region, but in fact an empire that once existed. If you are unfamiliar with Tartaria, I actually covered Elena Lyubimova's written article from 2013. I laugh a little because this happens to be the most viewed video currently on my YouTube channel. But don't thank me, thank Elena. But once again, to be clear, I am covering present-day Uzbekistan because it's within the realm of what can be seen on old maps as Tartaria. Okay, so if you like looking at ruins, and that's your thing, it's kind of my thing, um, you'll have some fun if you go to Google Images and just type in Uzbekistan and ruins. And I'm going to cover some of this. So this was an Uz Uzbekistan travel website and this is an area called Kamper Tepa. Kamper Tepa. I'm probably saying it wrong. But here's Google Maps and here's Uzbekistan here and here's Samarkand, Bukhara, and Tashkent and this Kemper Tepa is in the south. So I will just read. This almost looks like the kind of material that WiseUp covers on his channel. Uh, I could go into pointing out that it looks like there's a lot of mud inundation and could speculate on this. But anyway, I'll just read what's written here. Mastering the citadel, which had multimeter layers starting from the Hellenistic era, had been started at the end of the 4th century BC. I don't always agree with that. Building of the lower tower, excuse me, the lower city 
under a unified plan at the beginning of the first century AD and lasted until the reign of the Kushan king Kanishka, the first third of the second century BC. Okay, so I tried looking up Kanishka 1, and it looks like he was originally from Peshawar, which is in Pakistan. Maybe this is Kanishka here. Well, again, I'm not really into that history anyway. The monument discovered by the acad academician E.V. Ritvel Adzi in 1972 was investigated by him for 30 years. Today, more than 70% of its territory has been studied. Kampir Tepa Fortress possesses a number of bright characteristics. The massive of a single Kushan housing estate opened here. On this website, they more or less have the dates of these ruins at like around the first century AD and BC and just before that time. Some of the reading on this website suggests they found some Buddha statues. And it's not clear to me, but they're also mentioning Zoroastrian type of statues. But I have not seen any pictures of those here on this website. Well, I don't know what to say about what I'm looking at, but I can tell that there's bricks here. This looks like this has been bricked up. So are these foundations, tops of houses? What is this? Okay, I actually just came across a really good Stanford University website and it gives a lot of really good pictures of these uh, ruins and just before I cover the Stanford University website I'm going to show you the area which it's talking about so okay just again uh, Uzbekistan is here here's the Black Sea here's the Caspian Sea here's Uzbekistan and so when we zoom in uh, Tashkent, the capital, is here. Samarkand is here. Bukhara is here. And if you go up here, there's these um, towns called Nakus and Urgench. And this website I'm going to show uh, features ruins between this region. And they're talking about like Kalas, Q A L A S, Kalas, which are the ruins, which are the names they give to these ruins. So I zoomed in on Uzbekistan, and here's Nukus, Nukus, here's Urgench down here, and here's the Amudarya, which almost deserves an explanation, which I'll try and get to. But here's the regular map, and... just try and read this information really quickly. Uzbekistan, April 2018, so this is a few months ago. Kalas of Karakal Pakistan, and I know historically looking at maps of Tartaria, there is an area called Karakal. So anyway, Kalas of Karakal Pakistan. The country of Uzbekistan is politically divided into 12 provinces, Andion, Bukhara, Fergana. One capital city, Tashkent, and one autonomous republic. The latter is the rather mysterious Karakol Pakistan, sometimes called the Forgotten Stan, located in the far west of Uzbekistan, while Karakol Pakistan is much larger than any of the twelve Uzbek provinces. Most of it is a barren flat desert, but on its southeast this desert is dotted with a number of old ruined fortresses, Kalas. How can that be? Thousands of years ago, the Amu Darya, which is the major river that actually runs along the border, the southern border of Uzbekistan, thousands of years ago, the Amu Darya River did not flow into the Aral Sea, that's a desert today, more or less, but into the Caspian Sea during the second millennium BC. Let me show you a map. So here's Uzbekistan here, 
and this is the Caspian Sea. Here's Transcaucasia. You've got the Black Sea, the Cas or the Transcaucasia, Caspian Sea, and here's the Caspian. And up here are the uh, is the Aral Sea, and it's pretty much turned into a desert. You can even see it here. So they're saying this Amu Darya, which runs actually along the border of Uzbekistan used to flow into the Aral rather than the Caspian. They're saying something like that. So this is a typical image of what the Aral Sea looks like today. Sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I'll start reading again. Thousands of years ago, the Amu Darya River did not flow into the Aral Sea, which is a desert with, you know, deserted ships, but the Caspian Sea, which is the bigger sea, to the west. During the second millennium BC, it changed direction, well, I don't know about the history, and instead flowed into the Aral Sea. It then watered a region that became fertile and increasingly populated well into the first millennium AD. Most of the Kalas, these are their fortress names, of these deserted fortress ruins, most of the Kalas have been built during this period to control the region and protect the agricultural settlements from nomad raids. Some may have been fortified residents, others pure military barracks. However, by the end of the 9th century, the Amu Darya changed course again, still flowing into the Aral Sea, forcing the population to leave some areas for lack of irrigation water. Numerous kalas, that's these ruins of stone fortresses, numerous kalas had to be abandoned and the land around them became a desert. An excellent reference to Karakal Pakistan, its people and the kalas by David and Sue Richardson can be found here. Well, maybe that's worth clicking on. Much of the information given below was drawn from this reference. A uh, map showing the approximate locations of the sites I visited, red dots. Their presence coordinates can be downloaded by clicking here. I won't. And opening the download cams at Google Earth file. Okay, again, uh, here's Nukus, and down here is Urgench. And I suppose the red dots are all of the sites of these fortresses that the author has gone to. So Shilpik, Toprak, and Kazil, Ayaz, and Jambas. Okay, so once again, I'm just showing you a map, map of Uzbekistan, and the author of this particular website is in the area between Nukus and Urgench. So this is an aerial view. Toprak Kala. Toprak Kala means clay fort, which seems quite appropriate today. It was built sometime between the 1st and 2nd century. It forms a 500, well, it forms a big rectangle, hundreds of meters. Okay, uh, entrance of the High Palace from the northwest. So this is Toprak up here. It's kind of north of Urgench. Toprak. Be nice if there was a man or a woman standing by just to get the scale of the picture. Again, Toprak. view from the high palace toward the north east with the northeast tower in the middle of the photo the white areas in the surrounding desert are salt deposit view toward the northwest tower at the center of the photo the photo caption is on top of the image so view toward the northwest tower at the center of the photo Um, view from the high palace toward the northeast corner of the enclosing high wall. Note again the salt deposits. I guess they're saying this is the salt deposits. I don't think that this was the Aral Sea. I don't know that that's what it's saying, that this used to be underwater. I have to look at the map again. The Aral Sea was much more north. This is not former sea land, I don't think. Uh, Kizil. Okay, so again on this guy's map, Toprak and Kazil, so we're still in this area. I've seen this word come up before. This is Kizil, Kizil Kala. So this is Kizil, K 
Hizil Kala. This Kala was also built between these centuries. It may have been restored during the 12th century prior to the Mongol invasion. Its horizontal size is thus, about 65 meters by about the same. Okay, so view of the southeast wall, which has been partially restored recently. One may not like the appearance of the rebuilt sections, but they protect the wall from crumbling farther down, further down. It also gives a better sense of the former majesty of the fortress. Okay, so yeah, they are restoring these ruins. I could leave a cynical comment about that, but what do I know? Okay, so this is being described as a non-restored portion of the northwest wall. I mean, you can use your imagination to think of how this might have ended up looking like this. You can only speculate. It looks almost melted or... I don't know. Views of the interior of the Kala with its surrounding walls. Okay, so I looked at the map again, and the we haven't covered it yet, we're getting there, uh, but the next place we're looking at is Ayaz, so it's a little bit northeast, Ayaz Kala. This site consists of two main structures, a large defensive refuge, referred to as Ayaz Kala 1, dating from the 4th or whatever century, on top of that flat hill that provides views over the surrounding plain. A much smaller feudal fort referred to as Ayaz Kala II, built between the, those centuries, standing on a smaller hill south of Ayaz Kala I. views of the walls from the inside. And well, I could speculate on what we're looking at it we're looking at here, but I'm not quite sure myself. Views over Ayaz Kala 2 from the southwest corner of Ayaz Kala 1. So we're on the Ayaz Kala 1 and we're looking over to number 2. I couldn't help it, I went and Google image searched Devil's Tower, Wyoming. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I just wanted to compare the image because it does look a little bit like a tree stump. And yet it's got windows. Okay, so the next one I guess we're looking at is John Boss Kala. John Boss Kala is the most impressive Kala I visited. As I arrived at the site quite late in the afternoon, the lighting was much better than for the previously visited Kalas. It has slightly twisted a rectangular layout and its walls measure up to 20 meters. Let's sneak another one in here. View of the northwest wall, the current entrance into the enclosure, is the opening on the right. Okay, so back to our map here. We looked at Toprak and Kizil Ayaz, and now we're looking at Jambas, although it's written down below as Jambas. Okay, so here's Jambas. It's a little bit smaller, 200 meters by 170, 20 meter tall walls. View of the, the northwest wall, the current entrance into the enclosure is the opening on the right, but the former entrance was actually further to the left through an intermediate court through an intermediate courtyard visible in the aerial photo. Wall of the entrance courtyard to take his word for it. View of the entrance courtyard. 
view of the walls from the inside, the double walls contained at least two, probably three levels of archer galleries. Bows and arrows, okay. Don't know about that. Pretty flat landscape. Okay, now we're looking at Chill Peak or Chill Peak. For lack of a better place, I included this monument in the page despite the fact that it probably never served as a fortress, although it may look like one. Instead, it is believed to be a tower of silence, a dogma, built by Zoroastrians for exposing dead bodies to the vulture's excarnation. Okay, I think maybe. Okay, excavations suggests that it has been used up to the time of the Arab invasion in the 7th century, that's the Muslim invasion, as Zoroastrianism was the official religion of the region prior to Islam. The approximately circular top of the tower has a diameter of 65 to 70 meters. So this is even smaller. So looking at this map again, this is Shil Peak or Chil Peak up here. It's along the Amu Darya. So this is the Shil Peak or Chill Peak one. Uh, what is they? What are they saying? The tower seen from the base. Platform at the top with the Amu Darya River and Turkmenistan in the background. I guess this is the Amu Darya River. It's flowing through here, and this is Turkmenistan. This is the Amu Darya. This is the main page, and I will leave this as a link in the description below. And I'll probably look at this more myself later. These are just a few images that I pulled off of Google Images. So I'll go through them. This is Toprak Kala. That was actually in the website I covered. This is also Toprak Kala. Toprak Kala as well. Toprak Kala. Not sure where this came from. This is Uzbekistan ruins. This is an image from Samarkand. And this is one of the main mosques there. In fact, it's almost the major tourist attraction, if not in Samarkand, but in the whole country and I'm going to get to covering that more in a moment. But I'm glad I did find this old image of Samarkand in 1890 because one thing I'd like to compare is the exterior of this mosque and even some of the remains and ruins because I'm, I'd like to take a look and see at how much they've renovated it since and whether all of the tile work that they have put on it recently is actually original. Anyway, uh, there also is lots of evidence of mud flood. Okay, once again, uh, Uzbekistan is here. Oops. And Samarkand is over here. Tashkent is up here. So this major mosque is in Samarkand. This one here. Okay, next image. This is in Shakriz Sabz, Uzbekistan. My so I looked up Shakri Sabz, Uzbekistan, and it's south of Samarkand. But this is one of the main ruins that I see is from this area. Shakri Sabz, Uzbekistan. Okay, and I just Google image searched Shakri Sabz. Okay, so this is Shakri Sabz, and they've got Amir Tamur, 
and once again, according to official history, Genghis Khan's grandchild was Timur, and there was like a Timurid, Timurid dynasty in this area, and so he's got a statue of him. Okay, now I'm going to turn to covering some of the major cities in Uzbekistan. So I'd like to start with Bukhara. Let's just try to give a really brief reading. Bukhara is a city museum with about 140 architectural monuments. The nation's fifth largest city. It had a population of a quarter million as of the 31st of August 2016. People have inhabited the region around Bukhara for at least five millennia and the city has existed for half that time. The mother tongue of the majority of the people of Bukhara is Tajik. Located on the Silk Road, the city has long served as a center of trade, scholarship, culture, and religion. UNESCO has listed the historic center of Bukhara, which contains numerous mosques and madrasas, as a World Heritage Site. I'll get some better pictures in a moment, but we're talking about the Kalyan or Kalan Minaret, the Great Minaret. The Kalyan Minaret, more properly minara e kalan also known as the Tower of Death, as according to legend it is the site where criminals were executed by being thrown off the top for centuries. The minaret is most, fam most famed oh this is a different minaret, is most famed part of the ensemble and dominates over historical center of the city. The role of the minaret is largely for traditional and decorative purposes. Oh, I guess it is this one. This is the Kalyan Minaret. Okay, next, the Kalan Mosque, arguably completed in 1514, is equal to the Bibi Kanim Mosque. This is in Samarkand, so this is not the same city. We're looking at Bukhara right now, and so we're looking at the Kalan Mosque, not this one, which is in Samarkand. Anyway, this one in Bukhara is able to accommodate 12,000 people, well, let's just go look at some pictures of it. Okay, so here's the Kalan Mosque. And we talked about this tower a minute ago. This is both in Bukhara. We're talking about Bukhara. So this is again a different view of the Kalan Mosque in Bukhara. Once again, the Kulan, Kalan Mosque in Bukhara. And this is neat. This is the Kalan Mosque in Bukhara, but this is an old image, and you can see it's not very well kept. Are there anything, is there anything in the picture we can discern as far as the structure of the building? Well, I don't know, did these uh, bases hold uh, framing, perhaps? Is there something we can read into there? I did go lo looking up some old images of Bukhara and I came across some Uzbek and Russian websites. So this is an old image of Bukhara. You can see the... What was that mosque called again? And that tower. Looks pretty messy. Looks like it hasn't really been inhabited. I mean, does a city that's been inhabited continually look like this? I'll try to remember to keep... to, uh, sorry, to provide a link? That's not a very nice subject. This is another old image for Bukhara. Looks like an Italian website. Okay, so I guess I'll just finish Bukhara off with the... What do they call it? Mir al-Arab Madrasa? Mir e... Okay, so just back to the map again on Google Maps. Um, the capital is up here, Tashkent, Samarkand, and Bukhara. We were just looking at Bukhara. And before that, when we were looking at ruins, we were looking between Nukus and Urgench. All the ruins, all these old Kalas were in here, and the Amudarya runs along the border and down below the border here. So anyway, going to look at Samarkand.
Okay, so very quickly, Samarkand. Alternatively, Samarkand is a city in modern-day Uzbekistan and is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in Central Asia. Well, I'm going to look at some old pictures from the 1890s in a moment, and I'll tell you right now, I think that it may not have been continuously inhabited, at least by not very many people. Okay, there is evidence of human activity in the area of the city from the late Paleolithic era, through, though there is no direct evidence of when exactly Samarkand was founded. Some theories propose that it was founded between the 8th and 7th centuries. Okay, let's look at some major buildings. Okay, so the list is here of some of the main sites. Uh, the Rijistan, the Bibi Khanim Mosque replica. So it's been rebuilt. We're going to look at that in a second. Gur e Amir and the Observatory of Ulu Beg. So this is the Rijistan in Samarkand. And I looked up some old images from the 1890s, and this is also the Rijistan in Samarkand. Here's another image of the Sherdor Madrasa Rijistan Samarkand and this is 1890 and you've got to wonder why the bushes are so overgrown like this. It's like nobody trimmed them and not only that but uh, I don't know is this building not important enough to like not put your like shacks and stores next to? Maybe I shouldn't be uh, a wise guy. I don't know. These are just some images of Samarkand. Shahi Zinda Necropolis. Again, this is 1890. And I don't know. Does it look like it's been continuously inhabited? It looks like something happened here. It looks like things are a little bit destroyed and everything's covered in mud. This image is called Outskirts of Samarkand. It's probably not too distant from the previous picture I just looked at. Looks like the same buildings, just a different angle. And I don't know, is this the big mosque here? Not sure. It looks like somebody still has to dig this place out. Okay, so the next building I'm going to look at in Samarkand is the Bibi Kanum or Bibi Kanim Mosque and this is probably the biggest one and the main attraction of if not Samarkand but probably the whole country and that's this mosque back here. Once again the Bibi Kanim Mosque is actually a replica I'm not entirely sure what that means whether it was like ruins and they were built up a little bit. The, the mosque Bibi Kanim Mosque is one of the most important monuments of Samarkand in the 15th century, it was one of the largest and most magnific magnificent mosques in the Islamic world. By the mid-20th century, only a grandiose ruin of it still survived, but now major parts of the mosque have been restored. It is interesting that a word like Hanim, or Hanam, 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 Hanim, is a lot like Khan, or Khanate. So, I don't think that's a real stretch, or Cohen, or yeah, Hana, or Golden Horde. Um, a photograph taken sometime between 1905 and 1915 by color photography pioneer Sergei Mihailovich Prokudin Gorsky shows the mosque's appearance after its collapse in the earthquake of 1897. That's some interesting color. I didn't, okay, the, there is a caption, the ruins of the mosque around the turn of the century as depicted in Samarkand by Richard Karl Karlovich Zomer. So, before I get, before I forget about it, this is the Uzbekistan state emblem and it was changed since Soviet times. Here's the flag. I'll just read this. The state emblem of Uzbekistan was adopted on June the 2nd, 1992. It is similar to the emblem of the previous Uzbek 
SSR, which I think is this here. Like other post-Soviet republics whose symbols do not predate the October Revolution, the current emblem retains some components of the Soviet one. Well, it's saying that somehow this uh, star of Rub el Hizib, which is a square within a square with a circle in the midder, mi middle, is a symbol of Islam, and somehow that's incorporated into the symbol. Okay, so it's talking about this emblem a little bit more here. In the center of the emblem depicts the Huma bird with wings spread. In Uzbek mythology, the symbol of happiness and freedom. Uzbek poet Alisher Navoy characterized the bird Humo as the kindest of all living beings. The Humo, or the Huma, also Homa, is a mythical bird of Iranian legends and fables and continuing as common as a common motif in Sufi and Diwan poetry. Although there are many legends of the creature, common to all is that the bird is said to never alight on the ground and instead to live its entire life flying invisibly high above the earth. Okay, that's pretty deep. But anyway, if you ask me, this uh, symbol looks a lot like a uh, griffin. Griffin. Which is like a symbol of Tartaria. I think Philip Druzhinin was recently asking in one of his videos for people to submit images of griffins close by to them once again. Okay, I'll try to cover the capital city a little bit here. Tashkent is the capital of the largest city of Uzbekistan as well as the most populated city in ex in ex-Soviet Central Asia. Though the larger urban centers of Urumqi in China and Kabul in, or Kabul in Afghanistan lie well within the geographic region of Central Asia with a population in 2012 of 2.3 million. It is located in the northeast of the country close to Kazakhstan border. Okay, once again, uh, Tashkent is up here, which actually borders Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Kind of goes up this way. So here's a postcard of Tashkent, and it has uh, very western looking architecture in it. This almost could be Germany or Ukraine or Poland or one of these places. Okay, so this comes up for Tashkent. I haven't found the name for this one yet. Okay, so I found this website almost by accident. Uh, Uzbekjourneys.com. I'll just read the first paragraph. Tashkent's churches. About 87% of Uzbekistan's citizens follow the Sunni Islamic tradition. The country is famed for its glorious mosques and madrasas. There are also Christians. Most of them follow Russian Orthodoxy. The Jewish population is numbered around 5,000 in Uzbekistan. Here are three of Tashkent's churches well worth visiting. Well, I'm not going to read all the descriptions, but this is Holy Assumption Church in or Cathedral in Tashkent. Sounds uh, Catholic. Uh, it could be Orthodox, I don't know. I guess if I actually read the description, I'd know. Tashkent has four Russian Orthodox churches, the largest being Uspensky, which is Holy Assumption, which is that one. Okay, this one is Sacred Heart of Jesus. Or Sacred Heart of Jesus Church is popularly known as the Polish Church because Polish soldiers stationed there in Tsarist times wish to have a place for worship. I guess the real question is when this was built and who built this and yeah where are the uh, construction photos but you have a Catholic Church in Tashkent in Uzbekistan well if I read the description it said that this uh, Sacred Heart Church was construction ceased in 1917 okay uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Uzbekistan construction began on the Evangelical Evangelical Lutheran Church of Uzbekistan in 1891 and the first service held in 1896. Okay, here it is here. Okay, so I wanted to read about the Amu Darya, as it actually runs along the border, the southern border of Uzbekistan. 
The Amu Daria, also called the Amu or Amo River and historically known by its Latin name Oxus, Oxus, is a major river in Central Asia. It is formed by the junction of the Vaksh and Panj River, which I guess starts in about Kyrgyzstan. and flows from the north westwards into the southern remnants of the Aral Sea. Oh yeah, I want to look at Aral Sea as well. In ancient times, the river was regarded as the boundary between G Greater Iran and Turan. Okay, so here's a map. I think this is the Caspian up here. No, I'm sure of it. And it flows along Uzbekistan's border. Oh no, wait a minute, that might be the Aral Sea. Actually, that's right, because Uzbekistan is a landlocked country. I just wasn't used to seeing the Aral Sea so large. Anyway, so yeah, the Amu Darya flows down through here. Apparently, it originally flowed from the Caspian at different points in history. Okay, I'll read about the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea was an endo, endor hike lake with no outflow lying between Kazakhstan in the north and Uzbekistan, Karakalpakstan in the south. The name roughly translates as Sea of Islands, referring to over 1,100 islands that had dotted its waters. In the Turkic languages, Aral means island archipelago. The Aral Sea drainage basin encompasses Uzbekistan and parts of Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and Iran. Oh, I didn't read the whole article, but it said that there's efforts to try to restore the RLC. And there's this file that shows this. Okay, so I found a chart. 1957, the level of the RLC in late 1950s is customarily used as the reference to see how much water has been lost. 1982, in the early 1980s, the accelerating drop of the sea level is evident. Salinity is rising. Fisheries are shrinking. 2000, the Aral Sea splits into north and south. Not only has it lost most of its water, but fishing is also nearly gone. The Kok Aral Dam begins to allow water in North Aral Sea to rise. And 2015, despite the expansion of North Aral Sea, only some 8% of the water volume of the late 1950s remains. And so this is how you get a lot of images that look like this today. Okay, well, that almost wraps up all of the information I wanted to cover as far as the major cities in Uzbekistan. I know you can never really cover enough, but that's as much as I wanted to cover. Uh, one last point I wanted to tie in. The Bibi Kanim Mosque, which I guess is a replica, has this uh, exposed shape. And then, of course, there's a mosque in Bukhara that also has a similar style. Well, I'm not showing the best picture of it. Okay, so this will do. This is the Bibi Kanim Mosque in Samarkand. And I just wanted to point out that these archways all um, kind of point to the center of this square. And the one in Bukhara is very similar to this. So I don't know. I'm not too sure what this device does, but using my imagination, it looks like maybe this isn't just architecture, but it actually served some kind of purpose. And I don't know, could this be sound for reverberating back and forth and ultimately concentrating in the center? There's no way I can prove that, but I did notice that in one of Philip Drzhinin's recent videos on 19th century India, where he posts up a bunch of uh, images, um, there's some mosques that actually have this very similar style. Now this is not in Uzbekistan, this is in India, but here again you've got these major archways, and even here as well, and it all kind of centers on this water pool in the center of this parade square or market square. So just saying that this is actually some kind of style of building where they do it like this. Screenshot.
Now, just saying that these images in India, these towers and things, look a lot like the ones, these buildings look a lot like what's going on in Samarkand. And kind of the same with this image as well. Okay, so this is one of the channels that I've recently been looking at and trying to study. And it's slow going because I don't speak Russian. But this is Sergei Ignatenko's website. And if you just look at some of the things that he discusses, you can translate it to English. He's talking a lot about Tartaria. And one of the videos in particular that I've been looking at is this one here. It's a four-part documentary. And this is part one, and he's talking about Great Tartaria. Now, this video came out in May of 2016. So, you know, it's about a year and a half old. And, uh, well, what did I really want to discuss? Well, he's looking at some maps on Gallica, Gallica, and yeah, he's looking at maps of Tartaria, and so I've actually gone to his links and tried to look up some of these maps of Tartaria. So I clicked on the eighth link down, and I ended up getting this page, and so what he's looking at here is, well Martin looks at these books too, but um, this is like the 1733 book, and there's actually different editions of it, but a book like this has contained in it some maps of Tartaria. Let me just show the cover page. Try to get a zoomed in shot of this. So this is uh, La Galerie Agréable du Monde, où l'on voit et un grand nombre de... So it's got like maps, Anyway, of this book, what I'm particularly interested in, once again, whoops, there it is, are the maps of Tartaria. So there's page 46 and 47. So I'm just going to click on this one and open it up. And these are the Peter Vander R. Vander A. maps. So this is Tartaria. Uh, this the map is called Magni. Chami Imperium, Mare Tartaricum, so that's the Tartaria River, Lake, something. Anyway, um, here's the Caspian Sea here, and this is really what I want to look at. So on this map, we basically have uh, Uzbekistan. Of course, this map is from, well, I better check the year. Okay, well, this book was from 1733. I don't know when this map was from, but that's at least the date of the book. And yeah, we have a lot of questions about timelines and dates, so we never can be sure. But anyway, I'm just going to point out the three major cities on this map which I just covered. So I covered Bukharia, Samarkand, and Tashkent. So here's the Caspian. Doesn't look like the Aral Sea really shows up, but here's Bukharia or Bukhara, Bukhara, spelled a little bit differently. And here's Samarkand, and I guess Tashkent should be over here somewhere. Actually, I'm remembering that Tashkent really isn't coming up on this map. But here's where I've been putting a little bit of effort into this. So if this is Bu Bukhara, and this is Samarkand, how about all the other names on the map? Can we look into those and find out if all these other cities exist? Okay, so here's what I did. This is the exact same uh, number 46 map in the Vander A uh, map on Tartaria. And I just, here's Bukhara, here's Samarkand, and just with the paint program I cut out all the city names and put them along the side here. Then with pencil and paper I wrote them all down and then I typed them out. Here's another, here's another map that appears in Peter van der Oz's book of 1733. This map is called Le Grand Tartarie. And I did the same thing. I zoomed in. Who's, here's Bakara. Here's Samarkand. So this is map 47, or basically page 47 in the book. And I cut all the names out. Here's Samarkand, Bukhara, Tashkent appears on this one. Cut them out, and uh, I wrote them all down and typed them up.
Okay, I I did I did this as well. Okay, on the seventh link down, on Sergei Ignatenko's links, uh, he included another map, and I call this one the Scary Face map, because unfortunately they've got these evil-looking figures down here, which I don't even really want to look at. But this is the Iodicus Hondius Gerard Mercator map, and Gerard Mercator, the Mercatoria map. I guess is probably from between 1512 and 1594 because those are the dates given for Gerard Mercator's life. I think that's what that is. But anyway, once again, uh, here's um, Uzbekistan. I was almost hoping to take the shape of Uzbekistan and superimpose it on top of this map just, just to see what would happen. Granted, this map might not be to scale, but you know, it might give an idea on these city names. But anyway, long story short, here's Samarkand and here's Bukhara and I think Tashkent appears on this as well. Okay, Tashkent. Tashkent appears up here. So this has the three major cities. Now as far as all the other cities, I really have no clue. You might you might accuse me for having too much time on my hands. That's actually not true. But um this is the scary face map, Gerard Mercator and Samarkand, Bukhara, and once again I cut out all the city names. It's very quick and easy to do. Uh, stuck them here, wrote them down pencil and paper, and then I typed them out. Okay, so then I took all of these map names from View 46 map, View 47, from the Vander R map, and then the scary face map, and then I took all the names of the modern cities of Uzbekistan today, and I put them in a column as well. So now I can compare the historical names on these maps with the cities in Uzbekistan today. Right, so I did that. And I'm going to try and leave these in the description below somehow, although I think this is a lot of material to retype in the description. I'm only going to use a couple examples. I hope this isn't boring for people, but I'm going to use a couple examples. So there's this city called Taras, and it appears on this map, this map, and this map. Taras, uh, Taras, and spelled a little bit differently, Taras U Dalan. Now I don't want to get off track, but I you, but I knew a Ukrainian guy with the name Taras. I'm not saying that's connected. But the problem is, is that when I went to look at the cities of Uzbekistan today, I did not see a Taras. Termez is... No. I don't see a Taras. Okay, I got distracted. Forgot where I was. Okay, but anyway, this is the scary face map. And here's Samarkand. Here's uh, Bukhara. And above Samarkand is Taras up here. Just to show you, it's the scary face one, right? So this is the Gerard Mercator map, and Taras appears on it here. Oh, okay, so I think this is um, this is map 46 from the Vander Aa book, and Taras is actually up to the east, but there is a Taras here. Okay, so this is map 47 in the Vander Aa Tartaria map. I'll zoom out in a moment. Here's Samarkand, here's Bukhara, here's Tashkent, spelt a little differently. And Taras U Dalan appears kind of up this way, northeast. Okay, yeah, I said I was going to zoom out. So you can see this is the Le Grand Tart Tartary map. So that's only three different maps. I'm sure there's other. Um, Tartaria maps out there that I could look at, but that would be a lot more work. And that was just one example. Maybe I spent too much time explaining it. But anyway, yeah, uh, Taras does not show up as a modern city in Uzbekistan. Not that I can find. Maybe it's a small city, but uh, yeah, in this list of 66 different cities in Uzbekistan, Taras does not show up. One last example. Asko, Akzu, Aksmuma, or Aksu, shows up in all these old three maps, but it doesn't really seem to show up in the cities today in Uzbekistan.
Okay, so there's a lot of neat things I could point out having looked at these maps. The main purpose of what I was trying to do is to look at maps of Tartaria and to try and see if the city names match up with present-day cities that we understand today. And this would provide some kind of continuity between these ancient cities and the modern ones we have today. And, well, this is kind of getting at Mud Flood and Tartaria and, and, and trying to make connections. I haven't really explained it very well, but hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Uh, this is map 47, and I will point out that there are a few recognizable cities today, like this is Afghanistan down here. Interesting that they call this area the Indies, right? So I guess this is the East Indies. This is not India, but now when we understand the West Indies, well, this makes a bit more sense. But here's Kabul, Kabul, Afghanistan, Kandahari, I guess I just mentioned that. Um, but what was neat that came up is uh, Petit Tibet Royum. This Royum comes up a lot. I think it's almost like a royalty or like monarchy, like a kingdom almost. And there's a few other ones. But yeah, uh, Petit Tibet Royum. But this is nowhere near Tibet. Just to show you, like Tibet is western China almost and well Turkmenistan's way up here so to have places here called Little Tibet is it the same? Could it just be a coincidence of names? Okay so I'm all over the place with ideas but these were the most interesting things I came across so Sergei Ignatenko in his video on Tartaria and the history of Siberia starts talking about the different costume dress that was apparent in some of these areas right and one of the main things he starts talking about is this one here um, this is a Tibetan a Tibetan and one of the comments he's making is that you know Tibet today we understand as like Asian people right so could it be that in this illustration of like historical costumes that maybe they didn't know how to draw a European well then he goes and shows some other images of some of the other cultures and he'll show that like no if you look at like Koreans or some of the Chinese or Japanese um, depictions of people it's like no in these images they actually look very Asian so it's not like the author of this book didn't know how to draw a European but here you have a Tibetan and he looks well if he doesn't look European he looks maybe Turkish or something like that but anyway it is interesting that I w that when I was looking at this Uzbekistan area of Tartaria on this number 47 map that there is a kingdom of Tibet that shows up. And this is the little kingdom of Tibet. So could there perhaps be a bigger kingdom of Tibet? Well, I'm not really sure. Actually, uh, Sergei Ignatenko kind of says the same thing about Koreans even. Uh, apparently it gets drawn as this European type of figure. But then, like, look, this author of this costume book it clearly knows how to draw Asians and Asian features like this is a Chinese person so yeah maybe well this costume book this costume book that he references off of the Gaelica website is from 1844 so I don't know were people in Tartaria different in appearance according to what they should be like in these geographical regions of Korea, uh, Tibet, and different parts of Tartaria. Anyway, uh, it's late, and I think that covers all the things I wanted to talk about. Hopefully that's clear enough, and yeah, thanks for watching.